Hey guys, my name is Mike Warren, and welcome to my channel, Laughing Stock Media. A little while back on here, I made a video called Dragon Ball Z from a Christian Perspective. Now, I've been a lifelong Dragon Ball fan, and for most of my life, I have also been a Christian, a uh, person who believes in the death, resurrection, and godhood of Jesus Christ and the beliefs that that entails. In that previous video, I talked about my perspective and perception of Dragon Ball as a franchise, the story, and the different elements in there, as well as, of course, in the different perceptions and perspectives that other Christians have throughout the world, some good and some quite the opposite. And I broke those down. And what this series really has to offer fans of anime, movie, cinema, and Christians in general. Now, I'm going to be following that up, expanding upon it in this video, in which I'm going to talk about something which is what Christians can actually learn from Dragon Ball. Because, of course, despite the fact that all of the most important lessons of our lives might be found in this book, the Bible as it is, the uh, book literally in the uh, language in which it translated from, a number of books, 66 in fact, depending upon your uh, version of the canon, <laughs> and that's a whole can of worms, even for Dragon Ball fans alike. But with that being said, there's a lot that we can learn from fiction too, from stories, even other mythologies in some cases, which many people might look at a story like Dragon Ball or comic books or various other franchises as a kind of mythology in of itself. But very often, despite not necessarily being put there intentionally, there are things that really echo elements in the Dra uh, Dragon Ball story and in Christianity, kind of paralleling each other. And so I'm going to be bringing some light to that, shining a light in the darkness, as it were, and discussing that, beginning with one thing, that character being Goku, can teach people in that Goku is the main character of the Dragon Ball story. And not just that, but Goku additionally, well, he's somebody who in many ways has a lot of different Christ-like elements, shall we say. Things that he does throughout the story that many people in the Christian perspective and worldview, as well as others, are able to learn from or have their beliefs even more affirmed by, shall we say. For instance, one thing that Goku consistently does throughout the story is he likes to show compassion to or love thy enemy. Look, for instance, what happened with Piccolo, and I'll be getting a lot into Piccolo in this video for sure as well. Piccolo was the reincarnation of the Demon King, essentially like the devil, the evil counterpart to the god of the earth in the mythology of Dragon Ball. And he wanted to kill Goku. He blasted a hole through him. He was going to call all of his friends, his uh, adoptive family on that planet. We found out more about his real family later on. And he was going to do that much more in a negative way. But what happens? Goku defeats him. And when he has this evil character defeated, does Goku go to kill him? No. In fact, he does the thing that most people attribute to the Cell Saga, but no, Goku did that way sooner. He gives his enemy a Sensu Bean, a miraculous kind of healing item, which allowed him to jump back and, of course, swear that he would avenge his father and himself in this case. He is his father and himself. Uh, sort of interesting parallel to, of course, Christianity, uh, the Trinity, and the triunity of God, the monotheistic uppercase G God. And I'll be getting into some more of that too, again with Piccolo. Very interesting character to draw those similarities to, but Goku does this many times throughout the story in terms of showing uh, his enemy's compassion. In most worldviews, that's the opposite of what you should do. But what does Goku do with Vegeta? Now, in this case, Goku does admit to a degree that there is some selfishness in this case, because he does want to fight Vegeta and defeat him, whereas he was unable to before. 
but he still allows him to be spared Krillin. He's right ready to go. He's about to get his, uh, his kill on a main villain at this point in the story. That comes in the Cell Saga, as I talked about in a video you guys can see in the top right for, uh, corner for Dragon Ball fans. I would recommend it for anyone newly getting into the franchise to wait a little bit, at least until you're done with the Cell Saga at that point. But either way, the fact of the matter is Goku allows another enemy to be spared, and I'll get into some of the ramifications of that soon. The next arc, well, what happens with Frieza? The greatest, most iconic villain, maybe, maybe not the perfect villain or the best villain in my estimation, as I talked about again on my channel with regard to Cell being the best villain in my opinion. But either way, Frieza killed Goku's entire species. He was like the King Herod in a sense. You know, he was trying to wipe out everyone below a certain age to eliminate the potential rising of the Messiah. Goku, in this case, in uh, the Dragon Ball fiction, kind of became that sort of character. Again, echoing kind of a Christ-like mentality. He became sort of like uh, the Friedrich Nietzsche version of the Ubermensch in this world. Of course, many people would attribute such a thing to, you know, getting off in a, in a whole other tangent to their belief in like the Christ-like messianic superior ultimate figure. Of course, everyone trying to find their completion perfection in Christianity through being more Christ-like, like the Messiah, Jesus. Now, what happens here? Goku, he could have left Frieza to die. After all, this is all Frieza's fault. His own Frieza's technique allowed him to be cut straight through hurt significantly dropping down uh despite being an evil reptilian creature like satan of course he was 666 times stronger than goku when he goes kaioken times two against ginyu and of course vegeta as i had just shown before in his great beast ozaru form so you know toriyama pulled a lot of uh, devil symbology let's say in terms of freeze as a character but goku he spares him. He heals him. He heals the one who can't even walk and allows him to, well, float in this case. But either way, he gives his friends ultimate killer, his greatest enemy in the franchise, his energy and lets him live. Until, of course, he has to fight back against him only in self-defense to kill this character. Because again, Goku doesn't really fight for the most part for killing. He has had points in the past, especially when he was young. And, you know, he saw Yakan as a monster. So he's like, okay, goodbye, Yakan. But Goku doesn't go out of his way to battle for these reasons. Instead, he often instead decides to do it in order to push himself to his absolute limits. Or if he isn't, he will fight on behalf of his friends, his family, his loved ones. He'll take on their battles for them. Kind of like, you know, putting our worries, our fights, our struggles at the feet of Christ. Again, what happens in Dragon Ball, Goku takes on that kind of role as the heroic character, and he proceeds to challenge the evil, most evil being in the universe, uh, in this case, the uh, ultimate power that is vastly above everyone that he knows combined uh, because of his belief in doing the right thing. And that's something that Christians face constantly, the persecution, much like Frieza persecuted the Saiyans and erased them for the most part, not in the Zeno way, but in the way that's actually, you know, relevant to the story. Uh, he also was so much more powerful than Goku could possibly even comprehend, but Goku never gave up. Just like God will give us the challenges that seem like they're so impossible for us to overcome, but then we're still able to do it through his power. In this case, Goku pushes himself to his absolute limits, not in order to necessarily kill someone in order to punch and defeat somebody into the ground so that he can become the best version of himself that we can be, which in many cases uh, echoes the ideas of Paul's letters to the Corinthians, where he talks about do everything for the glory of God, you know, be the best version of yourself you can be. So many characters in Dragon Ball are just like that, even Vegeta. You know, we can get into Vegeta as a character who, of course, we see him constantly training and pushing himself. The difference, of course, in terms of Vegeta is that, hey, that thumb, that's kind of like Vegeta's technique. The difference with Vegeta is that 
he always looks to himself as a source of pride in this case. You know, his Saiyan heritage, his uh, being the prince of power. But again, who is Jesus? Jesus is more of the prince of peace. And Vegeta is more of the prince of pride. Because his character always represents pride throughout the course of the story. But Toriyama shows through Vegeta the folly of pride. When he shows up in the Saiyan saga, he's the main antagonist of it all, the final boss, if you will, swiping half the height of his uh, friend who looks like Goldberg at the time. He looks more like Paul London or something, but uh, he goes on to just like constantly brag to Goku, but through Goku's power, his resilience and his friendship, he's inevitably able to defeat Vegeta. Well, Vegeta keeps coming back and back and trying to fight against and overcome many of the enemies within his way, only to not be able to do that. Like again, Frieza. I talked about Frieza before, but who's the one who defeats Frieza? It isn't Vegeta. Vegeta's not the one who becomes the Super Saiyan. That is Goku, the low-class warrior that Vegeta looks down on. Vegeta is so engulfed by his own pride, his own arrogance, his own anger, that when a low-class Saiyan decides to besmirch him by making him bleed, by pushing him to such a degree, he's willing to try and destroy the very planet, the Earth itself, in order to get back at him. But it is the low-class that inevitably outclasses Vegeta time and time and time again, because much like in the Upside Down Kingdom, we know that it's the meek who shall inherit the Earth. It is the more humble, it is the less prideful. And Vegeta, well, he learns that time and time again. Look at his downfall against Frieza. He powers up, he takes advantage of his, his biology, the Zenkai boost, and what happens? Well, he gets so powerful that he thinks he's the Super Saiyan, only to again get outsped, beaten to the brink of death, and then killed right before Goku stood up to challenge Frieza, just like Vegeta had just done that panel I showed you, he buries his friend, or not even his friend, his enemy as his friend, Vegeta. Again, showing the compassion, the love that's within Goku, that is more very Christ-like in that sense. Then we go on to Vegeta again. He achieves the legendary form of Super Saiyan. He takes it even further beyond, not the cool even further beyond like Super Saiyan 3, the one that seems cool until, well, Vegeta gets in his own way again with that thumb pose. And what happens? Well, he inevitably is overcome by his arrogance and pride. He could defeat the main villain Cell right here, but Cell talks him into letting him attain his perfection, which of course leads to Vegeta getting handed, uh, handily defeated, right? He gets Vegeta's technique, which is to be defeated. And uh, yeah, it just doesn't work out too well for Vegeta right there. His own son tries to prevent this from happening. And Vegeta's rage and pride is so great that he even attacks his own son and doesn't care about the ramifications until they come back on him. But Vegeta goes through a really great journey in the story. In the Cell Saga, he actually goes on to praise Goku and admits that Goku is better than him. This actually happened earlier in the story than we had thought, or than many fans actually think for the most part, where they think it just happened in the Buu Saga, which I will get to. But he talks about how Goku is just greater. He has to become humble. He does this again. He allows the main villain to get out, and Goku has to inevitably be the one who takes up, well, the mantle of the ultimate final hero to defeat him. But during that again, Vegeta's big story arc is what? He goes on to not only sacrifice himself, very important, which I'll get into soon, but not only that, he also goes on to admit, finally, 100%, that Goku is better. That he tried to live like Goku, to try and become you know, a family man, everything, as per Vegeta's development. He was allowed to be spared, and he became a far better person, he became inevitably a good person, and helped to save the Earth. But he has to humble himself, just like we all have to humble ourselves before God, and realize his pride is his folly in order for him to 
achieve his greatest self. Just like, of course, we know in real life, pride is one of the seven deadly sins. In the Christian belief system, it is, well, one of the very first, if not the first sin, the original sin of Satan, uh, which led to him helping, you know, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden story to lose uh, their innocence, eating the fruit, having the fall, lean to everything. And then, of course, the needing of Jesus to come into the earth manifested and then die for our sins and rise again. Speaking of that way, that's another thing that I just mentioned with Vegeta before, but also in terms of Goku. Self-sacrifice. You know, as it says in the Bible, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for those of your friends. Well, what do we see time and time again in the story? We see exactly that, where Goku especially is willing to do this. We see first he does this at the start of Dragon Ball Z, at the start of the new section of the Dragon Ball manga that preceded Goku's story from his childhood to winning the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai, the strongest under the heavens tournament. And then he has to sacrifice himself to take out his own brother, his evil brother in this case. There's a whole lot of themes that go into that as well, which I've discussed a little bit in videos in the past. but. The fact is, Goku allows his greatest enemy, who he spared, to help save the world, again, kind of in a redemption story, and gives his own life up for his son and for his friends in order to destroy the ultimate evil enemy at the time, until we realize there are two more, and Goku's more than willing to sacrifice his life in that case, too. Goku doesn't just sacrifice his life there, either. He also does it in the Cell Saga, which is even more iconic. In this case, he realizes the only way for them to, to stop the self-destruction of Cell from wiping out the Earth, killing his son and all of his friends, his family, everyone, is to use his ability, the Shunkan Ido teleportation or instant transmission, in order to give up his life, teleport Cell away, and then to, well, die. In this case, Goku dies with a smile on his face. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he chose after this to stay dead permanently. He chose to sacrifice himself twice over in this case so that everyone else could have a better life. Much like, again, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, hopefully I didn't ruin my microphone right there by bumping it, but he was the one who sacrificed himself. Uh, in order for us to have an eternity, a much better life than anything we can have in this world, uh, along with some resurrections along the way, and, you know, depending upon your beliefs in that case. But either way, the fact of the matter is that Goku did this time and time again. He even inspired Vegeta to do the very same thing. I mean, look what I just showed you before. Vegeta had such great character development throughout the course of the story, along with another character I'll get into soon. But as we could see, Vegeta in another really emotional moment. You know, this is yet one of the top five emotional moments for me and many other fans in the franchise. Vegeta embraces his son for the first time, this evil, ruthless man for most of his life who killed and did so many terrible things. He shows with one of his arms crippled. He uses the other arm to hug his son for the first time in his life and show him love and tell him that he's proud of him to take care of himself. And then he decides to knock him unconscious so that he can be carried away so that Vegeta can give his own life to defeat the ultimate evil villain at the time, uh, the Majin Buu. And as a result, we get Vegeta's final atonement, Vegeta's sacrifice, his final explosion in one of the best scenes ever in the franchise in which he says that he is doing it not just for his friends and family, his wife and son, but even for Goku, for Kakarot, the one that he used to hate. And um, it really is a great moment, again, that symbolizes in many ways and kind of like, again, reinforces many of the ideas that Christians already hold in which self-sacrifice, laying down your life for your friends and for everyone else is such a important thing to keep in mind and kind of helps, again, to visualize for a lot of people. Again, like this character here, Piccolo, I mentioned before that Piccolo used to be evil. He was the ultimate evil in the story before many other ultimate evils came along, right? That's a, that is Dragon Ball after all. And so what happens here? Well, Piccolo 
was the ancient evil demon who was released and took over the world, you know, like the Antichrist, the beast, Apollyon, the destroyer, or, you know, Satan, let's say. And what happened is that he was going to destroy sections of the planet and he was going to rain evil upon the world. Well, he was defeated by Goku, the child, you know, we have to be like little children if we're to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? And so Goku, well, he uh, entered right through Piccolo by punching a hole right through him and blowing him up because it was the 80s and people had to explode in anime. And what happened? Well, he was reincarnated. And as I said before, Goku spared his life and even healed his own enemy. He loved his enemy enough to, to do that. What happened even further? This led to Piccolo not only helping to save the world by killing Goku, but, uh, you know, in the process, it was, <laughs> he didn't do it just by killing Goku. He did it by killing Raditz and Goku sacrificed his life. But then Piccolo, it came time for him to act. He raised temporarily, you know, he trained, I'll say, because he isn't his real daddy. It's not like Yandu in Guardians of the Galaxy, Gohan, the son of Son Goku, who was the one who, you know, was his enemy. He raised his son to try and help him to fight against the evil enemies. And what happened? Piccolo rushed in and he sacrifices his own life. The evil demon king, reborn, even more powerful, you know, wants to take over the world, killed his father, everything. And he still rushes in, in front of an ultimate attack and gets killed in the process, even though he is the only character who truly matters if they survive this fight, because the fact is that he's connected to the way of the resurrection for people in the symbolic way, in the literal way in the Dragon Ball world of the Dragon Balls, he gives his life up in the importance, sacrificing him and Kami in the process for the son of his enemy because of love, because of friendship, because of, again, like it said in the Bible. So these are all things that I've shown you with characters like this, Piccolo, who even goes on to help to uh, raise and train Gohan's child, Pan, when he becomes a man and an adult in the future. Uh, Goku's grandchild, Goku's uh, other son, Goten, he goes through, because of the compassion of Goku saving him, and not killing him when he could have easily done so. And, you know, again, allowing his enemies time after time after time to flourish, to become a great character and helpful individual in the future. We have that time and time again, even beyond that. Just getting the extra credit and bullet points here. I took out so many different panels, guys, as you could see, like it goes on and on. But, you know, uh, there's another one, Android 16. This was an Android. He really loved life, as Gohan said in the dub, but he was an android. He was meant to kill Goku, to destroy the world if need be to, to finish that job. But he allowed himself to die for Goku's son, again, much like Piccolo, in order to inspire him to fight back against the evil being Cell at the time, uh, and in turn, allowed that final trigger to go through which allowed Gohan to achieve the form of Super Saiyan 2. And beyond that as well, there was also the instance of Boo, the final time we get this in the manga, in which Goku is fighting against even this being that's pure evil, essentially, its ultimate evil being, like I've said a million times in this video, and he is right about to kill him, but he doesn't actually want to. He doesn't like the idea of just killing him, and he feels sad that's going to happen. He said, you know, that he actually respects him and that he wants him to come back as a good guy in, you know, the reincarnation concept that they do have in Eastern uh, beliefs, which is instilled in this as well. And he wants for him to fight against this evil being, but as a good person. And this actually ends up being the case. Goku takes the final villain of the manga and then he takes him under his wing to train him and make him a better person. That is really, in many ways, like everything else I showed in this video, something that truly summarizes and is able to appeal to people with Christian perspectives, worldviews, beliefs, as well as many of the different words that are taught throughout the course of the Bible, the lessons and all of the ways that we live by. 
And so that's just some things that people who are Christians and really anyone from any worldview can take away from Dragon Ball. Many of the ideals, the story, and also the themes are universal, just like in the Bible. So many fictional stories were able to be inspired by the Bible, whether directly or indirectly. It's impossible for someone, even like Akira Toriyama, who lived on the other side of the planet and might not have necessarily had these beliefs himself, to not have been at least in part inspired by them. We know he was through osmosis, through Star Wars and other things. And I have a feeling that with characters like we see in the story that echo ideas directly from here, he might have been inspired a little bit here and there as well. But either way, we can be inspired by these words and by the lessons of Dragon Ball to be even better people, just like we can the Bible, and to, in some ways, maybe even, I don't know, minister a little bit ideas that come from here to those. If that's a part of your belief system, you're able to do that. I just wanted to kind of share what I thought in this case and an idea I've always had in my head about, you know, what we can take away as Christians from the Dragon Ball franchise. But let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. Christian, atheist, Muslim, or any other belief system, let me know down below. If you're new here, subscribe, enable notifications. That way you can see all my videos right away when they come out, as well as streams, shorts, you know the drill. And with that being said, thank you. God bless you all. And have a great day. Make sure to stick around because there's a lot more to come in the future. Yeah, and you better subscribe.